I've been in a series entitled uh, One Another, basically working through the different one another commands of Scripture and um, how they apply to us. Uh, For most of us, while we understand that we are called to live differently uh, with one another and act differently, whether it be with a fellow brother or sister in Christ or just a, uh, another human being, um, we may not always know what the Bible says and how to apply that. And so last week we did edify one another. This week we're going to do edify one another part two because that command actually shows up two times in scripture. And so last week we were in Romans. This week we'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter number five. Let's begin reading in verse number one. The Bible says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So let's stop for just a second. We preached through or taught through um, the book of First Thessalonians. I believe it was actually in 2021. Um, seems right, maybe. I don't know. Anyways, but we talked through the whole book. And one of the things that we brought out is how often Paul talks about eternity, how often he talks about the end, how often he talks about the day of the Lord or the rapture or uh, the end times or Jesus Christ coming. And so he's doing that once again here in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. He is talking about what is next. But he takes a second and he basically says that those who are in darkness do not understand this. It, It will overtake them as a thief in the in the night but he says you as children of light it should not creep up on you now watch this in today's world here's what we see so often i see one of two different kinds of christians i see the christian who is just completely does not care about eternity just completely ignorant and maybe, I guess, uh, void of understanding about what is to come in this life. But on the other hand, I see the type of Christian who, because of the way the world is trending, is beginning to wake up, which is interesting that Paul, in verse number six, uses this wording. He says, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore? Comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. There's so much in this passage since we've taught on it just uh, recently. We won't take the time to break this whole passage down. But we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians in these couple of verses in chapter number 5 through the context of edifying one another. Before we do that, would you read verse number 11 out loud together with me? Ready, begin. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. There's really a twofold command in verse number 11. He says, comfort yourselves together and edify one another. Let's pray. We'll ask the Lord to help us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that you are a God who has called us to live amongst other Christians. Lord, may we be a part of the edifying process. Lord, may we never be a part of the deconstructing process. Lord, may we never be someone who is tearing down those around us. But as we look at what goes on in the world around us, may we look to others to edify and to be edified. Lord, may we keep our eyes focused on you. May we seek to glorify you in all that is said and done. Lord, I pray that you give me the words to say as I teach. Lord, fill me with your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Last week we talked about how um, if you have a plant, 
you are constantly a part of the nurturing process. You're constantly a part of taking care of that and making sure that it can survive, making sure that it can thrive in a way that is edifying, that is running alongside of something and caring for it so that it can grow and continue to grow. As I was reading and studying for this passage, I was reminded of my first year in PE here at Franklin Road Christian School. School that I went to in West Virginia was a small school. We didn't have PE. And so I remember when we moved here, once you moved to fourth grade was when you got to start PE. The reason why PE was school was, or was cool was because it was different than recess and you got to change into a t-shirt. Okay. I know really exciting things. All right. So, but I remember I, the day that I got my FRCS physical education t-shirt and it was this ugly color of mustard yellow. All right. Now I think they're like a normal looking gray color, but it was this ugly mustard yellow and the words on it like like were literally from like the neck down like like they could not have put franklin road pe in a larger font than what they had and so i remember getting that shirt and uh putting it on in my first day in pe um we had a pe teacher that was a former baseball coach and so he came out and i'm sure that as a high school baseball coach and he had played college baseball i'm sure working with fourth graders was probably one of his favorite things in the world and so he had all of us come and sit down on the lines and and he said as soon as he walked out out, he goes, all right, there's a couple rules that we have for PE. And it's like, wow, this is already way more intense than recess. Like the fact that we have rules. Okay. And one of the rules that I can still remember to this day is he said, PE at Franklin Road Christian School is a construction zone, not a destruction zone. And I remember thinking, I have no clue what he's talking about. All right. And he said, here's what that means. He says, when you're in this gym or when you are in this class, you are a part of building up those around you, not tearing them down. The truth is, is that if you pulled up to a construction zone, it would have many of the same signs and the same caution tape and the same policies as what a destruction zone would have. But only one of the two are accomplishing something that is very evident and that is, that is showing up above the ground, and that is a construction zone. Destruction sometimes is a part of something. You have to tear something down to get it to where you can build upon it. But watch this. As a Christian, you should be a part of constructing those around you and not destructing those around you. And you say, well, why is that? Why would I want to be a part of that? Paul writes and he tells us here in verse number 11 to comfort yourselves together and edify one another. That command is not isolated in Scripture. Sometimes we look at that and we think, oh, yeah, that would probably be a good idea. Like, I should probably comfort someone. I should probably edify someone. But the context is what matters. And so I want to give you really three thoughts from this passage as far as how we can be a part of edifying one another. First of all, the thing, first thing that we must understand is we must understand the context of edification, the context of edification. It's interesting to me that the command to comfort yourselves together and edify one another is in the context of end times, okay? Sometimes we like to paint this flowery perception of Christianity, okay? It's super easy to do in our world, in our culture, in, in, the, in the American Christianity and with social media, it is very easy to paint Christianity as this big flowery thing. So we use these cutesy little backgrounds with Bible verses on it. And we, when we all talk about like, well, we live in community and we, we want groups and we want all this stuff and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. But watch this. Paul gives the command to comfort yourselves together and to edify one another in the context of the end is coming and you should be paying attention to it. You should be watching for those around you. The truth is, is that if we took a poll right now in this room and we said, how many of you, based off of what you know about end times prophecy and scripture, how many of you find end times prophecy comforting? There would be a few of you that would say, yeah, absolutely. I find end times prophecy very comforting. But there would be just as many Christians who, when they look at end times prophecy, say, yeah, that's a little bit concerning. There's, a, there's some things that I don't understand. There's some things that I, I feel like could scare the willies out of me, okay? There's some things that are, are maybe some question marks in my mind. But prophecy was given to us 
to comfort us. It was given to us so that we would know what to look for. Now watch this. If we can step back and look at the direction that the world is going today and never feel the need to run alongside of another Christian brother or sister in Christ, we've missed the point of it. I see a lot of people who want to talk about, well, you better get ready to meet Jesus, and they have yet to encourage anyone in their day-to-day life. I see a lot of people who say, well, the end is drawing near, and, and if, if this is going on in the world, and, and this is setting up for our end times prophecy, and this thing has now happened, and so we better get ready, and yet they never do anything to run alongside of another Christian. They never do anything to edify. They never do anything to comfort. They're just the doomsday prophet who never sees the command to edify and comfort one another, meaning this that the context of edification is that when you see that Christ is getting ready to make his appearance and his return, it should be more of a priority for you to comfort those around you and edify those around you, not less. And so if Paul was able to write this and say, when Christ is getting ready to return, when you see those signs, you... (laughs) you should be able to step back and say, who am I going to help? So the context of edification, but then notice secondly, is not only do we need to understand the context of edification, we need to understand the caution of edification. The caution of edification. Look at verse number six. He says, therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to see. Is that for us as Christians, there is a call for us to wake up. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I wish that I could stand up here and that I could take all of the current events that we hear so much about and that you see so much about and that our world is so consumed with. I wish I could stand up here and I've seen preachers who are able to do it. They're able to take the, what the Word of God says and they're able to take this current event and they're able to bring all of this stuff together so that you understand the, everything, the, all of the end times prophecy. I'm not that type of preacher or teacher. I'm sorry, okay? But here's what I do know. I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out that the world is changing and that it is changing rapidly. Okay? Some of this stuff has been going on for years. It's just that we have more access to it now. Okay? That as soon as one country drops a bomb on another country, social media blows up and all of a sudden everybody's changing their profile picture to have a flag in it and they're, they're talking about supporting this country and support. Okay, take the politics out of it. Here's what we should be stepping back and looking at as Christians. We should be waking up to the fact that Jesus is coming again. Okay? When you say, well, every generation of Christians before me has believed that Jesus is coming again. Exactly. Let's not let Christianity go to sleep on our watch. You know what I firmly believe? I firmly believe that the future of the church is not in this room. I believe that the present of the church is in this room. Meaning this. Now's not the time for you to be finding ways to get out of serving. It's for you to be finding ways to get into serving. Now's not a time for you to find ways about, well, you know what, my walk with God is really not that. No, now is the time for you to learn how to walk with God and pray even more so. Because here's what I believe, is that this generation's Christianity will be put to the test. And if you are just kind of flipping and on the fence about what you need to understand in Christianity, you will falter and fail when it gets tough. And he says, for let us not sleep, wake up. Here's my question for you. What do you need to wake up to spiritually in your life? 
What do you need to wake up to spiritually? Maybe it's that every single morning that your feet hit the floor, you see it as an opportunity for you to serve someone else. Maybe it's that you are looking at some of the decisions that you're making in life and you're making them selfishly rather than spiritually. It's time to wake up. It's not the time for self-centered Christianity. It's the time for selfless Christianity. Maybe you need to step back and you need to say, you know what? I'm just really not serving anywhere. I'm not giving. I'm not reaching others. I'm not a part of sharing the gospel. It's interesting to me that we use the term woke now to describe certain groups of people. Do you know who should be the most woke? And let me paraphrase before I say <laughs> any more about that. Let me, it, let me d describe that to you, okay? When I talk about going woke, I'm not talking about liberally going woke. Here's what I'm saying. Is the most observant and woke people on this earth should be Christians. Because Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, God through his Spirit, gave in his word that we are called to wake up. Meaning this that that is not a call to go woke and be liberal and to accept some weird theology, okay? It is a call for us to say, whoa, this world is changing. I better go and find someone to reach. This world is, is, is moving rapidly, and based off of what I know about Scripture, I better wake up. Now may not be the time for me to indulge in more Netflix. It may be a time for me to indulge in less Netflix. Now may not be a time for me to be super shy about my faith. Now may be the time for me to be very bold about my faith. Now may not be the time for me to step back in my Bible reading, but to step forward in my Bible reading. Why? Because we should awaken to righteousness and sin not, because there's some around us who have not the knowledge of God. I'm thankful for Kindred's prayer request that he mentioned today about Casimir, okay? You should have lost people in your life that you say, you know what, I'm not living this Christian life just so that I stay here. I'm living this Christian life and I want to go here because there's someone else around me who is depending upon me being the spiritual person that God has called me to be so that I can reach them. But then the last thing is this, is there's not only the context of edification and the caution of edification to not fall asleep, but there's lastly the content of edification. The content of edification. You say, okay, what do I edify those around me with? He says in verse number 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. I wonder when was the last time in your Christian life that you said, you know what, I'm saved and that's enough. Can I tell you something that the Lord has been challenging me about? The Lord has been working on me so much about letting what Christ has done for me in salvation being enough for me. Sometimes what we are guilty of doing as modern day Christians in America is we're guilty of assuming that all of this external and extra portions of the Christian life are what make it a good Christian life. We look at the friends that we meet at church and we think, oh, Christianity is great because look at all of these friends. Christianity is great because look at the church that I get to go to. Christianity is great because I get to be a part of a class that serves breakfast in the mornings. Christianity is great because I have this or because I have that. Or Christianity is great because, look, I have a house and I have a car. and I have. What would happen if all of those things were stripped away? Would Christianity still be great? I would be scared to think that there would maybe be some Christians in this room that would not be good Christians if we were in China. To where if you had to sneak to church and, and that all of a sudden there wasn't a breakfast and coffee bar in the back. If, if you were under persecution, if you were under speculation from the government, 
we might not be as good of Christians as what we think we are. And when Paul says to comfort one another and to edify one another, it's interesting to me that he doesn't go through this list of things that they have as the church of Thessalonica. He doesn't say, you need to comfort one another because look at the nice, comfy chairs that you Which, by the way, I judged TACS competition in these chairs on uh, last week. I'm sorry that we bought those. Those things are so uncomfortable, all right? I was in those for like six hours. I now understand and I will start to try to make my lessons shorter because of it, okay? Just not today. We'll start that next week, all right? But he doesn't go through this list of things. Well, oh, you need to be so thank you need to comfort yourselves together because you guys have all these great friendships and you get to come and hang out and eat bread together and you get to do this and you get to have this. That's the reason why you should edify one another. No, he says, based off of what you know about Jesus Christ, he has saved you from wrath. He has saved you from what is to come. You now have an opportunity to rejoice and edify someone else because you're saved, period. And sometimes what we try to do is we try to encourage someone else by saying, oh, well, let me be this friend before you and let, let, me, let me text you and let's be accountability partners. Job didn't have that, and yet he continued to worship God. Paul did not have a lot of what we take for granted in this, li in this Christian life, and yet he did one of some of the most miraculous work for Jesus Christ. And here's what we have to step back and understand, is that if Jesus saved our soul from hell, period, that's enough. Are there additional blessings on top of that? Absolutely. Are there things that we can edify one another about? Absolutely. But those are not what we should find our identity and our encouragement in. Those can fade just as quickly as we can praise God for them. But if we can find our encouragement and our joy in the fact that our souls are not headed to hell, that's enough. And so when was the last time you stepped back and you said, you know what, I'm saved. That's a great thing. I'm going to live differently because of that. This past week, I told you all we went to Orange Beach and... Um, it was our first time kind of going there in the spring. I, I, I am not a beach person. I'm a, like, hide from everyone, like, sit in a cabin lake person. And so, but thankfully, we got, uh, when we got there, it was not busy at all. We kind of, uh, we ended up in a condo that didn't uh, have, like, anybody in the tower at, at the same time. And so we walked and I mean, I can, I actually have pictures on my phone of my kids playing on the beach and there's no one to the left of us. There's no one to the right of us. And I'm like, man, this is, this is great. And I remember the one day there was, um, there was a double red flag meaning that you couldn't get in the water, which I was perfectly okay with. As I told you, I had a hoodie on the whole time. And so um, anyways, uh, so I was sitting there and I just remember that I was looking out over the water and I was watching these huge waves come in. And I just had this moment where I was looking at it and I just thought, wow. Like, you ever have those moments where you're like, the ocean is just big. Like, it is so. And Baylor sits there and she's, she asks, like, these deep questions that you're like, there's no answer for that, Baylor. She's like, Daddy, how big is the ocean? And I'm like, it's, it's big. Like, it, it's just big. Like, there's no way I can describe it, okay? But I had this moment where I'm like, wow. If God created that, what else is he capable of doing? But then I had this very significant moment where it was like, the God who created that is the same God who saved my soul and set a redemptive plan in play so that I could have a relationship with him. That's mind boggling. That the God who could make a wave so big that it could take out a whole town cared enough for me that he would save my soul, that's, that's big. And I could sit there and I could say, oh, well, he's a great God because I got to go on a vacation. And he's a great God because he's given me a family. And he's a great God because he's given me this. Or he's a great God because I have a church. And he's a great God because I have a job. And he's a great God because I have. And guess what? Those are all blessings that you should praise God for. But if they go away, he's still a good God. If all of a sudden there is nothing physical for you to praise God for, 
you can still praise God because he saved your soul from hell. And there are too many Christians today that what we try to come together and edify and comfort and encourage each other with is all of these external physical things and we never touch the one thing that you're saved, I'm saved, and we can have joy because of that. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what my week looks like. And when you walk in the doors of this church, it shouldn't be, oh, this week was so awful. I got to get to church. It should be, oh, my goodness, I get an opportunity to worship the God who saved me this week. That's a different perspective that edifies those around us. And so the context is that the end is coming. The caution is to not fall asleep. But the content of edification is this. You're saved. So let's encourage those around us. Let's pray and we'll be done. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the day that you've given us. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I ask that those in this room would take the time this week to simply look and say, God, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for what you have saved me from and what you have saved me to so that I can worship you. In your name we pray. Amen.